are joined by Dr. Britt Anderson and Dr. David Foley um, to discuss firearm safety in the context of child abuse prevention. Dr. Anderson is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of Pediatric Emergency Medicine at the University of Louisville and Norton Children's Medical Group. She is originally from Kansas and completed medical school at Northwestern University and her residency at Northwestern University as well, and then went on to fellowship in pediatric emergency medicine in Cincinnati. So welcome, Dr. Anderson. Um, welcome to Dr. Foley as well. He is a native of Western New York and has been in practice at Norton Children's Hospital since 2003. He has served as the trauma medical director for the hospital since 2006 and has overseen the development and maintenance of the hospital as an American College of Surgeons Verified Level 1 Trauma Center. Dr. Foley received his medical degree from State University of New York at Buffalo and fellowships at University of Michigan Hospital in critical care and at Children's Hospital of Oklahoma in pediatric surgery. I know you both um, have a lot of passion surrounding firearm safety um, in our community and region and nationally, so thank you for being here. Okay, so this is a talk um, Britt and I are giving on sort of the impact of firearm injuries in children and sort of some prevention uh, possibilities. Um, I'll start off with uh, talking about some of our data um, as it differs from the national data and then uh, hand it over to her at the end here. Next slide. So, so this is an increasingly important problem. So as of this year, I think in March or April, firearm injuries have become the leading cause of death in patients under the age of 18, finally surpassing mortality from motor vehicle crashes. So it's, it's an important topic, I think, in injury prevention and, it, and also in terms of child abuse and neglect. Next slide. So a couple of definitions. First of all, projectile injuries are those that are inflicted by any type of device that leads to expulsion of an object. And that includes both firearm, firearm injuries as well as those sustained by BB guns, pellet guns, and those types of things. For the purposes of this discussion, we're just discussing our firearm injury data. So only those weapons which are uh, using a powder charge to fire projectiles, such as handguns, shotguns, and assault rifles. For obvious reasons, because of the velocity of those uh, weapons, there's a higher potential for injury. Next slide. Uh, in terms of classification based on intent, a few definitions or a few uh, categories. So injuries can be sustained as a result of assault, self-harm, uh, unintentional, or the result of legal intervention. Next slide. So this is just some national data that was published in the Journal of Pediatrics in 2017 using CDC and National Vital Statistics, uh, looking at all patients under the age of 18. Each year during that study period from 2002 to 2014, nearly 1,300 children died as the result of firearm injury. And interestingly, from a national perspective, 53% of those were homicides and 38% were suicides. So over 90 or over 90% of these injuries were inflicted with some type of intent. Only 6% were unintentional, and 3% were 3 were the result of legal intervention. In terms of fatalities, 74% were suicide, 14% were assault, and 6% were unintentional. In younger patients under the age of 12, the rate of homicide was three times higher than the rate of unintentional death. And in older children between 13 and 17, uh, there was a greater than 12-fold increase in death rate from firearm injury, largely due to increases in risk related to homicide and suicide. Boys were or for, were disproportionately affected, and African American children had the highest death rate secondary to homicide and unintentional death, whereas Caucasian and Native American children had the highest death rates secondary to suicide. Next slide. Other interesting parts of this study, childhood death rates from homicide increased during the first half of the study period, then decreased to below baseline levels by the end of the period. Death rates from suicide initially decreased, then rapidly increased due to the highest rates seen in history by the end of 2014. And unintentional firearm deaths decreased throughout the entire study period. Next slide. In terms of non-fatal injuries, there were over 5,000 per year uh, during the study period. 84% occurred in boys. 
The overall injury rate was five times higher than that seen in girls. 88 occurred in older children between the ages of 13 and 17. I mean, 80%, sorry. And the overall injury rate was 19, 19 times higher in children under the, than in children under the age of 12. 71% of patients in the study, the injuries occurred with some type of intent, either self-harm or assault. Next slide. This is just a schematic of uh, that data in terms of how it breaks down by population base versus uh, for all the states in the country. And an interesting part of this is that based on population, some of the places you might expect would have a higher rate per capita of injuries, both from suicide, homicide, and all deaths are not necessarily the places you would expect. Sort of demonstrates that this problem is ubiquitous. Next slide. In terms of our data, so there are a couple of differences with the types of patients that we see here. Uh, we are a verified level one pediatric trauma center and have been since 2011 continuously, but we always have been one block away from an adult trauma center. And although we accept patients between the ages of zero and 18 for unstable penetrating trauma, triage guidelines tend to send patients 13 years of age and older or 14 years of age and older to university hospital. As a result of that, the demographics of our firearm injuries are significantly different than overall national data and certainly different than U of L hospital. We tend to see many fewer suicides, many fewer assaults and homicides, and many fewer older adolescents. Next slide. So during the period of time between 2012 and 2022, uh, we've seen and treated 213 patients for firearm-related injury with an age range of in utero, uh, mom was shot at a club while still pregnant, to 17 years of age, with an average age of approximately 10 years. Next slide. This is just a graphic demonstrating the increased incidence that we've seen during that time period. There have really been two sort of doublings of our incidents. Uh, the first few years I started looking at this data, we were ranging between five and 10 patients a year. And then in the mid 2000, mid 2000 and teens, that number sort of doubled up into the teens and 20s. And then in 2020, with the advent of COVID and some other social related issues that were going on in at that time, we saw another doubling and we actually have had uh, numbers between the 30s and 40s in patients since then. And one th interesting thing is that although we've sort of gotten back to a much more normal life after COVID, the incidence of our firearm injuries has not decreased. And we're actually on pace this year to have a higher number than we actually did in 2020. Next slide. In terms of our demographics, our average age, as I mentioned, was just over 10 years. There was a significant uh, male predominance, 83% uh, to 16%. Uh, in terms of race, um, there are two ways you can look at this. The first way is that given the differences in overall population, that there is a certainly a predilection for firearm injury in the African-American population in our study or in our data. However, the way I like to look at this is 47.6% of the patients that we have taken care of have been Caucasian and a significant other percentage have been non-Black, non-Caucasian, which really identifies this as a ubiquitous problem uh, that affects all races, uh, even though it may affect the African-American population more significantly. In terms of location, um, also, I think this is important. Not everybody that gets injured by a firearm is injured in an urban setting. In fact, in our study, more patients actually have been coming from rural settings than from urban settings. And another point I would like to make about this is that based on our data, the majority of patients that we see, almost 60%, are injured close to or on their home property, uh, which identifies potentially some, method or some issues related to injury prevention, which we'll touch on later. Next slide. And this is where we differ the most from the national data. While the vast majority of patients in the, on, the, on a national level have been injured uh, either by some type of intent, either assault or, or a suicide attempt, 
because we see many fewer older adolescents, our data is much different and the vast majority of our patients are actually injured by unintentional mechanism. Uh, and I think it, I think that one of the things about being in a children's hospital is it identifies sort of this hidden population of firearm injury patients that you don't see when you look at the national data overall. Next slide. Here are some examples of the mechanisms specifically sort of taken from chart reviews. A two-year-old discharged father's handgun into his head while mom was in the next room taking a bath, and that patient did not survive. Six-year-old shot in the head by the father unintentionally while he was cleaning his gun in the house. Also, that patient didn't survive. Three-year-old self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head while playing with parents' gun in the house. Another fatality. Next slide. Six-year-old struck in the chest by a bullet fired up into the air on the street in celebration of New Year's Eve while the patient was traveling with her father to fix an air conditioner. This patient survived uh, uh, with significant disabilities after multiple operations. Another example of a 13-year-old who sat on a couch at home discharging an unlocked gun under a pillow into her face. This is a patient that started out with some significant developmental delay, could not possibly have been expected to understand how to, take, how to handle a gun appropriately. And this patient also survived with significant neurologic disability, much more so than she started out with. And a five-year-old deliberately shot in the face with a pellet gun by the grandfather's paramours in retaliation for the biological mother coming to pick up the child. This patient survived. And I guess what I want to say about those mechanisms is they reflect, they reflect what we see here on a regular basis. And although the vast majority of those examples are unintentional, I would hesitate to call them accidental because I think calling them accidental means that there was no way to prevent them. And I would argue that there was, with the exception of one potential example uh, in, in those cases, definitely ways in which those injuries could have been prevented. And I think that sort of reflects the discussion at a conference like this. Uh, next slide. In terms of additional statistics, our overall mortality for these firearm injuries was just under 11%. Average age of our mortality patients, 8.4 years. So these are not in our hospital, these are not kids who are out uh, shooting, you know, shooting guns in the community or engaged in any type of nefarious behavior necessarily on, on average. These are younger children. And when you, when you exclude the handful of older patients that we've had, the average age of these patients who are dying is actually very young. The vast majority of these injuries are brain injuries, traumatic brain injuries, gunshot wounds to the brain. And anybody who's taken care of these injuries under, knows and understands that in most cases, the outcome of these injuries is predetermined before the patient ever gets to the hospital. A much smaller number have died from chest injuries, and only one patient has actually died from an abdominal injury. In 82 per, uh, or almost 83% of these fatal, fatal cases, the mechanism of injury was unintentional, at least by chart review. Next slide. In terms of range of injury severity, we see an awful lot of patients who are not that badly injured, near misses. The average ISS is moderately severe at 12.3, with then obviously a range of one to 75, indicating a very severe injury. Next slide, please. Over 50% of the patients who are injured require some type of operative intervention and the patient's operative mortality uh, is just under 10%. Another 15% of these patients have some type of complication following their operation other than death. Um, the vast majority of the cases are done either by the Pediatric General Surgery Service, which would represent chest or abdominal injuries and occasional extremity injuries or neurosurgery. Um, which represent obviously craniotomies and other monitoring device placements. But there's a smattering of injuries to other parts of the body, including hand, orthopedic injuries, ophthalmology, OMFS, ENT, and, and on occasion cardiovascular surgery, indicating that these kids are injuring themselves in multiple ways in, uh, in a sort of a multi-system in multi-system fashion. Next slide. 
So in terms of take home points about our data, um, I would say that firearm injuries occur in children, not just older adolescents and are a significant cause of morbidity and disability. And I would also say that the incidence of isolated injury, at least at our institution, is clearly increasing. Younger children are not safe from firearm injury and they are particularly susceptible to fatal injury, particularly traumatic brain injury. And the majority of injuries that we see in our institution are unintentional. Uh, many injuries in these children occur in the home with a weapon that is owned by a family member or close acquaintance. And the majority of the fatal injuries that we see have no hope of treatment with a successful outcome other than prevention. Next slide. So having said that, I'll sort of touch on some of the sort of injury prevention topics and then let Britt take over and go into some more detail. So there's a, a Haddon matrix, which she'll discuss in a little bit more detail and based, it's partially based on five E's of injury, injury prevention. Um, the first of those is enactment enforcement. So those are basically uh, referring to laws that are designed to limit or prevent the injury from occurring. One point to make about this is that these laws are only as good as the efficacy with which they can be enforced. Some examples of these related to firearm injury include background checks prior to the, prior to the purchase of firearms, gun permits with some limitation on who can and cannot own a gun legally. Um, there was actually a study published at, out of the Children's Hospital of Boston in 2013 looking at Massachusetts data uh, as well as national data uh, based on a CDC review, which demonstrated that states with the most legal requirements relating to the purchase of firearms had a 42% lower death rate from firearm injury than, it, than did states with the fewest requirements. Um, and then also CPS and forensics laws. Uh, what, is the, what, is the, what is the teeth with which a CPS service or forensics evaluation can affect change in individual situations, and those are all legally based. Uh, next slide. There's a lot of debate about whether more strict gun legislation can help our children. I'm not really here to talk about whether or not I personally believe people have the right to own firearms. I don't necessarily think they don't, but I do think that there is probably some role uh, for legislation that would uh, serve as a checkpoint for people owning guns uh, who are, have proven themselves not to be responsible with them. Um, and, but I think it's clearly not the only answer here, especially when you consider the fact that the majority of our fatal injuries do not occur with people who are, be, who are acting with nefarious intent. Uh, next slide. In terms of CPS forensics evaluation, this is older data, it's a couple of years from being updated, which I apologize for, but this is looking at sort of the first two thirds of the, of the data that I was presenting earlier. And um, 64 out of the 112 gunshot wounds at this point had occurred at the, in the home or on property. In that 64 cases, 95.3% of cases in our hospital resulted in a CPS investigation. 27 out of those 64, 42.1 of those cases resulted in a forensics evaluation. And these are people who are extremely skilled and I have a tremendous amount of respect for. Their evaluations are thorough and the recommendations are typically very defined and very, um, and not, uh, you know, not subtle or wishy-washy in any way. Despite those evaluations and despite the, uh, the pretty much un universal CP inv CPS investigations into these cases, only five out of those 64, 7.8 percent of these cases resulted in an immediate change to the home environment of the patient or siblings, not counting follow-up visits to the house, which were quite common. And what that tells me is not that our people aren't doing good evaluations, but it tells me that there's a very limited amount that you can do legally to remove children from a potentially dangerous home environment unless the, acts, unless the injury occurred with intent. And we've already established that the vast majority of these injuries do not occur in that fashion. And so there's only so much that can be done from this end. And I think all those individuals are already doing everything that can possibly be done. Next slide. 
The next E is engineering environment. And these are actions that are taken to change the environment surrounding the injuries to reduce incidence and severity. And these, this system was de designed for motor vehicle crash prevention and has been applied to various forms of injury, including firearm injury. But with respect to firearms, um, examples of this would be built-in trigger locks for the guns, tying gun purchases to the purchase of a lockbox, and things that like this are unlikely to be supported or to be effective without supportive legislation. And they're actually useless without proper education for the owner. You can hand out all the uh, trigger locks that you want, but if people do not understand the importance of using them and of using lock boxes, it's not likely to be that effective in just individually by itself. Next slide. Emergency medical services is the third E, and I think that just re results in, or is referring to improving the efficiency and care of the patient after the injury during the treatment phase. And this stops, starts with the pre-hospital setting and progresses through the hospital and the trauma service and the emergency department and the ICU and all of those things. And I think honestly, we're doing a good job in Kentucky here. Dr. Fallot actually just published a, a paper in JAMA, I think just this year, um, where a national group developed a scoring system, state-by-state -state scoring system, looking at pediatric trauma systems across the country. And some of the, the uh, categories used to score each state included the presence of state funding, the presence of a trauma system, the, president, the presence and efficiency of a pediatric preparedness program, and other, other things of this nature. And Kentucky actually scored third in the country in terms of its in, in terms of its pediatric trauma preparedness based on that study, which I thought was impressive. We have two level one pediatric trauma centers in the state. We have a state EMSC program that's robust. We have we've had trauma system legislation in the state for many years, and I think that the various people that participate in the healthcare of these children through the from the pre hospital setting through the hospital, uh, uh, the hospital setting are all doing a very good job. But the one thing I would say that limits this is that as we mentioned earlier, many of these fatalities or a significant percentage are predetermined at the, tide, at the time of the injury. And so even though everybody's doing a great job, there oftentimes is nothing that can be, nothing that can be done by the time that they arrive. Next slide. And then education, which is the fourth E, and this is an active form of injury prevention in that it requires change in behavior on the part of the participant. This is probably both the most effective means of injury prevention and also the most difficult to achieve. There is evidence to suggest that it's most effective when utilized on a local or regional level, probably different, probably uh, just because there are different methods of education that might be more effective in local or regional areas that are different than other areas. Um, and it's probably the place where over time we should be able to make the most headway. In terms of firearm education, I think it's important to demystify guns for the uninitiated. I think the more education people have about how guns work, what their dangers are, how you should care for them, uh, particularly in the house setting, uh, the less dangerous they are likely to be. You want to be, we would be very good to be able to make sure that we are teaching gun safety to those who own guns or who are very, who are in close proximity to firearms. Educating adult gun owners about the proper way to store a gun in the house, keeping it safe from their children. So patients, this is an area where pe people who are uh, on the primary care front can affect change. Um, educating preteens and adolescents in the school setting. There's some evidence to suggest that Education of children about guns does not have any effect on the safety of guns, but I think patients who are in the preteen or adolescent category over time with the right educational program uh, might, might demonstrate benefit in terms of uh, understanding and knowledge in terms of their safety. Potentially, one of the things I've thought of is it's, you know, it's, been, it's been a huge topic across the entire country to have a stop the lead course in, in schools. We're doing this all over the place now where we're, we're teaching children how to stop the bleeding after a shootings. You know, this is, all, this is all secondary to the concern over mass shooting, but nobody's thinking about the individual shootings that are occurring in households. And rather than just teach people about how to put direct pressure on a wound and how to put a tourniquet on, maybe we should be trying to teach them about prevention at the same time. 
these things are already in place. And I think it would be not an unreasonable thing to try to tag gun safety education to these courses, which is our, which have already been successful, uh, successfully deployed in schools across our city. Once these people are educated, maybe these individuals would be educators in their own home or more safe with firearms when they reach adulthood. Next slide. And then lastly, evaluation. This is super important. Um, I think it's really important to have, to have advocates within the healthcare system that are evaluating the data and continuing to look at the data. You have to be able to periodically evaluate the efficiency of any, invention, any injury prevention efforts, and that, and that includes continuing to look uh, at our data, at our survival, at our incidents over time. And for that, I'm very thankful for Norton Hospital um, and their, and their uh, recent significant commitment to helping out with acquisition of data and helping out with trying to develop injury prevention programs related to firearm safety. Uh, next slide. And with this, I'll turn it over to Britt and have her go into some more details uh, relating to injury prevention things that we are thinking about here. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Foley. Can you hear me okay? okay. All right. Um, so that was a great presentation. I'm going to go through a little bit kind of highlighting certain things that uh, Dr. Foley mentioned. I'd like to start by talking about data from the past couple of years, what's been going on, particularly with a, an eye towards child abuse and neglect, um, and then go into some prevention things as well. Um, I'm starting with the same point that Dr. Foley did just because it is so compelling. This is the paper that came out recently um, where it was found that uh, um, firearm injuries surpass motor, motor vehicle collisions as the leading killer of American children. This is a tale of two, two stories. So you've got um, the motor vehicle crash blue line there. And you can see over the past 20 years, there's been a sharp decline in injury. And in fact, if you could extend this graph out to the left, you would see that um, there was a huge decline over the last 75 years before that. Um, the firearm injury, unfortunately, you see that start to, to tick up. Um, you can see that these injuries both surpass um, cancers, heart diseases, um, and all other forms of childhood death, making it just extremely important that any conversation of child health talks about firearm injuries. Uh, next slide, please. This is a further breakdown, just looking at these recent years. This is national data again, 2019 in blue to 2020 in red. Um, and you can see within this time period, there is a significant increase. These are child fatalities. Um, I think most of us um, realize that unfortunately, children of color suffer disproportionately uh, to negative health outcomes and firearm injuries are no exception to this. Um, and then down below, you see the mechanisms with suicide and homicide um, being the most common mechanisms. Unintentional is relatively smaller or a, a smaller proportion, um, though tend to be the younger victims. And certainly, as Dr. Foley nicely outlined, um, patients that we take care of frequently at our institution. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about pediatric homicide and assault because it is such a large proportion of these um, fatalities. Um, as I just mentioned, they're a majority of the fatalities in a growing percentage from 2019 to 2020. This was the big driver in pushing firearm injuries ahead of motor vehicle collisions. The vast majority of these are in the older adolescent age range um, of the victims. And this is largely explained why we're, we don't see them at our hospital as frequently. They're usually taken to UofL, as Dr. Foley mentioned. But there certainly are young victims here. So what do we know about those young victims? We do know that there, there seems to be some differences that are important between them and their older counterparts. So some national data sets um, lend some view, some more information about this and how the victim um, and perpetrator are related. So according to the FBI Supplemental Homicide Report for the youngest victims, perpetrators are often family members. Um, and in fact, up until 11, two thirds of the perpetrators um, were older male family members. Um, according to the National Violent Death Reporting System, uh, 12 and under, um, uh, young victims uh, were often intimate partner violence related, 
most frequently in the home and most frequently with handguns. I think when we understand um, how dangerous intimate partner violence and domestic violence can be um, for partners, uh, we, we understand what a dangerous situation um, this can be for children. It is known that the presence of a firearm in the home is a key risk factor for intimate partner homicide. And a, what we are seeing here are children that are tragically um, caught in that situation. Next slide, please. This is a graph from the um, FBI data looking at the proportion um, of perpetrator, the relationship between the perpetrator and the victim. You can see here again that in the younger age groups for child homicide victims, the perpetrator is far more likely to be a family member or acquaintance as opposed to the adolescent victims where it's more likely to be a, a peer counterpart or unknown. Next slide, please. So I'd like to pause for a moment because this feels really overwhelming. This is obviously a massive um, and complex problem. And so I find it really helpful to, to take a, a lesson from history here. Um, Dr. Foley briefly mentioned um, William Hayden and um, Hayden's matrix. Um, and so I'd like to talk about the story of the success, the blue line in that, in that graph of the motor vehicle collisions um, that fell and why that happened. Um, it's been touted as one of the great public health victories of the 20th century. So if you compare two years, um, 1925 to 1997, in 1997, there were 11 times more cars on the road, six times more drivers, and 10 times more miles driven than in 1925. Despite this, there was a 90% decline in motor vehicle um, collision fatalities in 97 compared to 1925. It could have been very easy to say, hey, there's just gonna be a lot of road deaths, there's a whole lot of cars on the road and that's just part of it, but that's not what happened. So why is that? In the late 1800s, all the way up until the 1950s, accident prevention, as it was called then, um, what had, was different than it is now. It was very much a focus on the human factors and um, almost with a slight blame the victim kind of mentality. So there were certain people that maybe had some character flaws. They were a little more accident prone, like they were reckless or a little careless. And so injury prevention focused on these factors. So interestingly, this is when driver's licensing started to become a thing. Um, it wasn't until the 1950s when people really started to appreciate the physics and the biomechanics of injury, that injuries are simply energy transfer that overwhelms a tissue's um, capability, and that's how injuries happen. And so it means that we need to focus on other factors like cars and the environment. Infectious disease experts actually came out around this time and they were feeling pretty good because they had some antibiotics and some super effective vaccines. So we were making some serious progress on infectious diseases. Um, and so they started to apply those same principles for fighting infectious disease to fighting injuries. Um, this man, Dr. Hayden, William Hayden Jr., who's um, known now as the father of injury prevention, combined all these ideas into a conceptual framework called the Hayden's Matrix that I'll show you in a moment. Um, and he took this and really made an impact in motor vehicle collisions. This all sounds so simple now, um, but it is almost comforting to me to know that there was a huge amount of drama and controversy around this at the time. Um, this. Uh, then, and we see this now, I think, with firearm injuries to a certain extent. And so it's comforting to know that, hey, we've managed to get past this before. Maybe there is hope for it for the future. This car here was a General Motors Corvair, very popular car. The only problem with it is apparently it had a faulty rear suspension system. So I guess it liked to occasionally flip over and burst into flames. Um, and a famous book was written, um, Unsafe at Any Speed, um, kind of highlighting this, the, the, the car may do, be to blame for the injuries. Um, of course, the automotive industry, the insurance industries uh, didn't like this. And so a lot of drama ensued and it, it thrust this whole controversy into the public spotlight. This led to um, a series of really effective policies being implemented across the board highway design, automotive regulation, seat belts, speed limits, alcohol consumption laws, on and on and on. Um, it also led to the foundation of the organization that would eventually become NHTSA or the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, um, which uh, Dr. Hayden Jr. was the first leader of that. 
And so how did they do this, right? They took a public health approach. They focused on prevention. So they were proactive rather than reactive. They talked about community rather than just working on an individual level. And it wasn't about blame. It was about um, taking a step back and looking at the mechanism of these injuries. Next slide, please. So this is Hayden's matrix. Um, and so he, of course, used his with motor vehicle collisions as the example. And this one is filled out for intentional interpersonal injury by firearms. And you certainly don't need to read all of this, but I just wanted to give an example. So this came from, there's a big medical summit a few years ago with a lot of professional organizations. I think it was held in DC, like the AAP, the surgeons, uh, the AMA, the American Bar Association. They all got together to talk about firearm injuries. And what did they fill out? the good old Hayden's matrix. So across the top, you have the different factors. So the host factors, the people, the agent factors, that's the thing that transfers the energy. So the car or the firearm, and then the physical and social environment. Down the left-hand side, you have time. So you have pre-injury. So before an injury ever happens, this is primary prevention. Because of the high fatality rate um, that we know firearm injuries have, and as Dr. Foley also mentioned, this becomes a key part where we need to act to prevent um, childhood um, firearm injury deaths. Um, then you have the injury or secondary prevention, what factors can mitigate injuries. And then afterwards, this is where the trauma systems come into play. How can we get the best possible outcome after the injury has occurred? And so you're left with this matrix where you can fill things in. People often ask me, what, what, what policy, what one thing, what do we need to do to fix this problem? And the problem is, is there probably isn't one thing we can do. As you can see here, all these factors work together. There's probably a lot of different things we need to do um, to start chipping away at this problem. Asking that question is kind of like asking, would you prefer to have salt on the road when it's icy or would you prefer to have a seatbelt? Well, the answer is both. They work together, right, to decrease fatality. And I think it will be the same for firearm injuries in kids. So if we think about children in domestic violence situations um, that are killed by a firearm or injured by a firearm, how can we address this problem? Um, and so for example, host factors like substance abuse treatment, domestic violence screening, um, certainly firearm policies may play an impact here, like enhanced background checks and extreme risk protection orders, um, environmental things like addressing social determinants of health, job training, employment opportunities, all these factors that we know go into domestic violence will um, impact these injuries and save lives. Uh, next slide, please. So lastly, what do we do, right? This is a huge problem. We've got these big lofty dreams. Where do we start? Um, we do know a few things. We know that homes with firearms in them can be a risk for children um, for all mechanisms across the board. We also know that safe storage is huge. In fact, one study found a dose response relationship. That was a pretty major study um, that suggests that hundreds of lives could be saved if even 20% more firearms were safely secured. Um, so this is really important. Um, we do know, as Dr. Foley pointed out, that just giving the locks isn't enough. It's, it's getting families to actually use them responsibly and consistently. Um, and, and it goes so far as some people ask the question is, if a family knowingly has a firearm and chooses not to store it safely, is that neglect? And, and what do we need to do about that? That's where policies like child access prevention or CAP laws come into play, um, which are policies um, that are supported by some evidence that um, th that strong CAP laws decrease um, injuries to children. So let's just start by talking to families, um, talk to people we know, talk to patients. Um, we need to be able to have conversations about this um, in a respectful and non-judgmental manner. And there are steps that we can we can start to take and really save some lives. So I'll stop there and save just a couple of minutes for questions if everybody, anyone has them. And thanks so much for your attention. Awesome, thank you. Um, one question that came across in a different way is how effective are gun locks? Obviously, I know you both made the point that they have to actually be used to be effective, but, but when they are utilized, how, how effective are they? Yeah, they, they, they are quite effective. Um, so if they're... 
sorry, there's an airplane flying by or something, if you can hear that background noise. Um, but, they, but they are quite effective with studies showing um, decreased rates of particularly suicide and unintentional injuries um, when they're consistently stored. Um, there also is some evidence that perhaps they can um, impact even adult crimes because oftentimes firearms are stolen um, to perpetrate other crimes. Um, so they may have pretty widespread effects. Of course, they have to be used and used consistently. Um, and that's that's where it's a little tough. Can you follow up with, I think there are some gun locks available for our emergency department. Are there other resources that you know of for families who may be seeking that type of device? Yeah, yeah, we do. And um, this is another place where Norton's been really supportive. Um, I know many of the primary care clinics have um, cable locks. Um, or trigger locks, and um, we do in the emergency department as well for families that are interested. Um, and so they they are something that um, are relatively inexpensive to buy. There's a wide range of options for families. You know, families choose to own firearms for all sorts of different reasons, and so it's probably not a one size fits all approach. I think there's a lot of different reasonable ways. Um, the AAP does recommend um, storing firearms unloaded, um, locked with the fire with the ammunition locked and stored separately. Um, so this could be accomplished with a, tr a trigger or cable lock, which is relatively inexpensive. Um, you could use a lock box, which costs a little bit more, um, but is often easier to access. Um, or, of course, gun safes, which can become quite costly, um, but are, have a lot of advantages as well. So I think it's a matter of putting it on family's radar that this is an important safety issue um, and that there's choices here um, that responsible folks can use to keep their kids safe. Great. Well, thank you both very much. I don't, I don't see any additional questions in the chat or in the question and answer box. So um, really appreciate both of your expertise and time today and this presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.